Alrighty. And we're on. Yeah. Orson McCormick, say hello. Hey guys. <laughs> Speaking to the mic, Bella. Oh yeah. <laughs> so Orson's first podcast here today, but uh, you're coming off a fresh win. Yeah. At XSC. Um, two weeks ago, I think. Two right weeks now. ago? Yeah. Um, yeah, we had four, four days notice. Uh, I, Renato messaged me and the first one I saw it, I was just like, because it is my, my first fight without the, the shin guards on. Yep. Um, of course, like I was ner- like nervous a little bit and then once I thought about it, then, you know, I kind of came to terms with it and then, you know, I just said yes. I trusted Renato, what yep. he, um, he thought was going to happen. Actually, let's just pause for one sec. I'm just going to oh, turn yeah. that TV off because that's going to be a distraction later. Yeah, no problem. Alrighty, and we're on. Let's try this again. I had to uh, restart because the TV in the background was going to be a bit of a distraction. So uh, let's, let's go back. Uh, we were talking about your first fight. So at XFC, it wasn't yeah. your first fight technically, but mm. yeah, let, just talk me through. So what happened in that? Um, yeah, so Renato basically told me exactly what was going to happen. You know, um, uh, we were going to throw two hard shots right at the beginning. He was going to come forward, exactly what he did, and then uh, slipped right underneath his shot. Uh, shot for the takedowns, probably the best time takedown I've ever landed. <laughs> um, Did you feel like GSP? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was a great feeling. But then, um, yeah, landed on top. Um, I started. To, I went for the submission straight away, like because I was just so uh, so Your excited. Journey? Yeah, just yeah. so excited. Like I'd never experienced anything like it. Just walking in there, um, and once I landed that takedown, I, I landed up in side control, and I just went straight for the Kimura. I yep. mean the Americana straight away. Yep. Um, but then I heard Renato like screaming, like, you know, relax, relax, you know, go to mount. And then, you know, I kind of settled myself, went to mount and then fl- flattened him out from that position. Another thing that we covered already yep. um, in the in those videos. I, uh, did you see? Yeah, I saw yeah, the video yeah. there. Yeah, Renato put up. Yeah, so once I flattened him out, then we landed the rear naked. And uh, I think you saw like right, it was kind of, his chin was in the way. Mm. So then I came through with the other hand. Yep. And because of the, the space that the chin and uh, my arm made mm. that left arm just fit him right perfectly after I held that on for a second he wasn't tapping and mm. that's uh, Renato actually said that as well he wouldn't tap yeah um, so then I switched the palm to palm yeah and then from that I had so much leverage there so I just held that I think you went out in like five seconds wow but yeah I've never I didn't even think you could go out that quickly <laughs> but yeah, yeah you never been put out like that either no, I, no? I've never been uh, I don't think I've ever been choked out I've been like of course, I've been choked before. You've always tapped. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, it's never, I'm never getting. No, never gone. To what sleep, about like know? seeing stars? Because I, you know, I, I can tell you plenty of times when it's happened to me. Um, one with uh, my coach Dave Tong at ICC. He had me in like a lapel choke. Like he wrapped his gi around my neck, mm. and just the angle, like he, he, whether we rolled or something, and literally, like it was didn't even feel like three seconds. Mm. And um, I've, I've luckily tapped because I was blacking out. And mm. then as the blood's just sort of starting to come back up, I'm just like, oh. Give me a second. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely <laughs> been putting in some chokes and stood up and like, you know, kind of yeah. lost it a bit. Yeah, but um, I feel like the harder you put it on, the the quicker uh, that makes them fall asleep. Mm. But yeah, provided you you're technically sound, right? Like, can't just you know grab on the jaw and then try and reef it. It's not gonna yeah. work. But if you got a, a good position, a good angle, and then you put put the squeeze, especially on. the amount of leverage yeah. you can put on the choke, it dramatically changes it. But, yeah. Um, yeah, there are definitely chokes like deeper than others. I I feel like. Yeah. Um, yeah okay so then from uh being that it was your first i guess uh one without the shin guards and all that like talk me about the talk to me about the atmosphere like how, how did you find the atmosphere compared to where you you know in previous comps and things like that because you've done like jiu-jitsu comps and all that sort of stuff yeah it's very different when it's like you know you gotta walk out song you gotta think <laughs> about that you gotta think about the crowd mm. you know and there's all these other elements into it i guess what sort of stood out for you the most as you made that first walk um definitely the crowd Mm. Yeah, like when I was just standing up in the cage and I was just kind of bouncing around, just waiting. Like there are, uh, you know, guys from the opponent's uh, team just like screaming out at me. I, d- I didn't even know what he was saying, but he was just screaming at the top of his lungs at me. I'm just like kind of stand- just trying to ignore it. But yeah, it just went on. But yeah, it was definitely the crowd. Mm. Um, I am very grateful though for doing all those jujitsu comps just from very young, you mm. know, because I feel like it... Uh, you know, for some, when I walk into a jiu-jitsu competition, I don't get too nervous anymore. Mm. Yeah, um, you don't think about it, right? Yeah, and it's I feel like, like that, inspiring. Yeah, I feel like it has uh, helped me, uh, you know, with walking into fights like that. Yeah. Um, and just all competition in general. Mm. Just uh, all that jiu-jitsu has helped a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Mm. And then what about your parents? So when, when you know, four days notice, yeah. and then Renata messages you and say, hey, you know, we've got a chance, last minute guys pulled out, and so we can probably slot you in and up you go to F- XFC. What did you say to your parents and what did they say? Yeah, they were not, not happy at all. Oh, really? Yeah, not happy at all. Um, you know, it was all this like, you know, he's, he's like 38 years old. He has this different type of strength. Um, but yeah, they were very, very worried, mm. you know. Um, but it, the thing was, like, I just turned 18 as well. Yeah. So now I can, like, make my own decision. Like, they can't, like, tell me Stop to me. stay. Yeah. yeah, but when I first told my dad that I was, that I took it and I said yes to Renato, like, he was finding a way for me to, you know, try to cancel it. You yeah. Know? Wow. Just, but, but, you know, because he was worried, yeah. you know. And I can understand it. Like, How he's it's against doing. an unknown on four days' notice. He's 20 years older than me. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, we came, came through and we got the win. So. Yeah, okay. Mm. And then uh, afterwards, so what did your parents say after? Oh, yeah, they're over the moon, okay. you know. Yeah. <laughs> but all of a sudden, you know, like the different strength and, you know, just all, goes all out. out. The window. Yeah, all out the window. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. but, yeah, I just had trust in uh, Renata and I knew myself I was ready, so... Mm. Yeah, I just didn't take any chances. We went up there. Yeah. Mm. It's, I think that's a, a very important thing, you know, for a lot of athletes uh, when you're fighting, you know, especially as your career goes on, uh, people get caught up in this idea, like, you know, if you get like a management team that's trying to book your fights and, and book engagements and all these other things for you, is that the people that need to be picking who you fight and who you don't fight is your coach, mm. right? Because they're the ones that know your style the best. They're the ones that know where you're at mentally, you know, in terms of your preparation and your training. And they're the ones that know, you know, what's going to give you the best uh, chance of achieving success, mm. right? Sometimes there might be a fight that's like this, you know, it's just worthwhile taking just because it could be a big name or something like that. Mm. Um, but other times it's like, you know, you really got to think about your longevity in the sport as well. Because, you know, when your career is limited to, say, 10 to 15 years, you know, you need to be able to make sure that you can make the biggest impact pop- possible in that short amount of time. Mm. And then be smart enough to also exit at the right time so that you still have, you know, a new chapter in your life and all these other things that you can go and pursue after it. Mm, of so course. let's let's wind it back a little bit because um and I want to get to you know the the, the the little bit of that bullying story. Ah yeah. Right? But let's <laughs> let's wind it all the way back and um mm. let's 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 go back to like what was your what's your first memory? Like what can, what is the first thing that you can remember like from being young? Yeah, so it, regarding that uh that video. No, no, not oh. regarding that video in oh, life. Yeah. What's your first memory? Uh, regarding what? Like growing up. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example so you can think, get a bit of time sure. to think, right? So yeah. one of the memories that stands out for me was um, my, my brother, he's seven years older than me. Mm. But when we were young, so I don't know how old we were at this point in time, but let's say I was like four. Um, and I think there was a point where I was a, it could have been a, a bit younger than that. But uh, I used to remember in summer, we had these two massive plum trees in our backyard. Mm. And they were so big that you couldn't reach the fruit on the top of the tree, right? But... Um, you know, as, they, as, as the summer wore on, like the plums would drop to the, fl- the ground. And me and my brother, we'd pick up the rotten ones and we'd throw them at each other. Mm. Right? And that's yeah. what we used to do. Yeah. We used to just throw rotten plums at each other. Yeah. And um, there was this one time, for whatever reason, like I was, I was thirsty. So I was like, oh, I, I want to drink water. So then I've gotten the hose and I put the hose in my mouth. And then my brother's turned the tap on, um, but because it's such a long hose, like, you know, it takes time for the water to come, come oh, through. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so what's happened is that when the water's come through, it's, I've drowned. And really? I've passed out, yeah. And, yeah. and then, like, I, I believe I had to go to hospital and all that sort of stuff. But, yeah, I, I, I remember the part of putting the hose in my mouth. I don't remember what happened after that. And that yeah, was... Like, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> inter- like, it's interesting how... How did that happen? Like, you're drowning. Oh, because, like, I've got a hose in my mouth. Yeah. My brother's turned the water up all the way. But, you know, you've got to think I'm like a three, four-year-old kid. Oh, yeah. Okay. By the time the water's gone through all the hose and then come out the other end, it's going so fast that, mm. like, I didn't get a choice where it went. It just went everywhere. Yeah, like, right. in, in my mouth, in my nose, in my lungs, of everything. And, um, yeah, I've, blacked, I've passed out. Yeah. So, so that's a memory that I have. That's probably my earliest one. Uh, aside from that, it's maybe like, you know, um, stepping on a bee when I was, you know, at the same place. You know, mm. uh, there was a bee on the ground and I've stepped on the bee and the, the pain of... The bee sting, like yeah, I can remember right. things like that. But how about you? What, what would be your first? I do. I do remember uh, asking my dad to start a martial art for the first time. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so at first, like my dad was like a massive UFC fan. Yep. You know, and I w- I walked into like his office area. He was just working, and I told him that I wanted to start uh, ninjutsu. Yep. 
And then one ninjutsu. Yeah. One uh, ninjutsu. Oh, because cause all my friends were doing it, you know, like uh, just a bit like the thought of being a ninja when I was uh, that young was yep. just a, a cool thing to me. So, yeah, <laughs> I asked him that. So this was like maybe 11 years ago. Yep. Uh, and I asked him if we could start up. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like next week. Uh, do you remember uh, the... Uh, Jim Elvis Sinisic and yep. Team uh, Parosh had. Yeah, yeah. Sin- so we, Sinisic Parosh martial yeah, arts. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So I started up there. Ah, um, wow. Yeah, and I just started doing jujitsu there, and uh, right away I felt like uh, I was like pretty good at it. Yep. Um, but yeah, I had the, for a while I just thought I was just doing ninjutsu. Mm. So I thought I was becoming. You're gonna a ninja. be a ninja turtle. Yeah. <laughs> something like yeah, but yeah, that's how I started jujitsu. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mm. And so then. Um, you know, when it came to, to school and things like that, like, what, what do you remember anything about um, kindergarten, primary school? Yeah, like, uh, the whole, like, yeah, that, because uh, all my other friends were doing uh, ninjutsu. Yeah. Um, I'd get in, like, these massive arguments about, you know, jujitsu's ju- better, you know, like, <laughs> just these massive, like, long arguments about how it, it's better, you yeah. know. Um, and it always come to a point I would say, okay, like, we can, tr- like, let's, let's go ninjutsu versus jujutsu. And they'll say, nah, you know, the, the stuff that I do is it's too deadly for what, <laughs> too, too deadly for what you do. You know? but yeah. Um, Isn't yeah. it funny? Like, I think, you know, there, there's a lot of that uh, with traditional martial arts where it's like, oh, no, our techniques are too deadly. We can't, we can't use it yeah. um, because we're scared we're going to hurt you. But then it's like when it actually the pressure's on and you need to use it, it's like, you know, giving somebody a gun but never showing them how to remove the safety, mm. never showing them how to actually aim and shoot, what is recoil, practicing your aim and all that sort of stuff so that when it actually comes time to, to use it, like you, you're trying to pull on the trigger but nothing's happening. Yeah. Right? Mm. So, um, okay. What, what kind of a kid were you in, in primary school? Like how would you describe yourself? Uh, I was very quiet. Yeah? Very quiet. Shy. I was soft. Yeah. Um, you know, i cry over anything. Yeah? Yeah, I was just not... Uh, like for what I do now and what I train now, like what I want to do, I would have never thought uh, I would be doing it as a kid. Like sometimes I think about it and it just feels like, um, just feels like, uh, you know, I wasn't meant to meant to do it. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't have seen uh, myself as younger be doing what I'm doing now. What What you know? did you think you were gonna do? Oh, I, I've not, yeah, I had no <laughs> clue. Um, you didn't have any, like, yeah, you know, whatever want to be an astronaut kid. or... Yeah, whatever a young <laughs> kid wanted to do, probably. But, um, yeah, I only really started wanting, like, training like I do now when I was about, like, 14, mm. 15. Um, I just became obsessed with MMA. Mm. Um, I just started going anywhere to train, like, yep. anywhere. Because yep. there was just no, like, I live in, uh, like, Hornsby. Yep. And I just, there was, there's not very many good MMA gyms around so we'd be traveling like down to King's Academy just to get get training and you know I'd be training like Muay Thai only and Jiu Jitsu only and then you know go into IMAF events you know without MMA training yeah and trying to pull um, it all together yourself yeah because I just wanted to I was so eager just to get MMA training mm. um, and I just couldn't couldn't get it anywhere but yep. um, yeah I'm so glad we found FFT yeah because um, it's just completely changed everything, and I mm. feel like I'm getting like proper work in, you know, yeah. with these sessions uh, that Renato has going on down here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm very grateful for it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's nice to be able to put it all together. Yeah. You know, I, I'm I'm very similar to you in that sense where I used to I train I still do train everything separately. I do my jits separate, my kickboxing separate, mm. uh, and then you know uh, come here to put it all together. Yeah. And then also get my wrestling work and my cage wrestling work in. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the benefit of that is that you, ha- you sort of create this adaptability mm. where it's like, you know, okay, uh, when, I'm at, when I'm here, I play this style. When I'm here, I play a different style. And then when it's, when it's time to go, you've got this opportunity to then just blend it however you can see fit. And I think that's where the artistry comes from, right? It's like you're getting taught these fundamental skills mm. in these different spots, but then now it's an opportunity for you to go and create your own painting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So then uh, you're parents into martial arts at all or? so your dad's a fan of UFC did yeah, you train a, as well he was a massive fan uh, he did he did jujitsu like he, he started jujitsu for a while um, he's, he's been off it for a while yeah. like I, I, every time I ask him he always says tomorrow but uh, <laughs> you know uh, he got up to got the blue flu do you, do you, have you heard of that yeah. yeah yeah you get the blue belt and then yeah, you got the blue belt accomplished 
done yeah. and then just steps out of the steps out of the training for a while. Yeah, I'm the opposite spectrum. I'm the I'm the forever blue belt. Yeah, <laughs> just stay as a blue belt. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you been a blue belt for? Uh, well, so I only put the gi on in 2019. Um, really? Yeah. So I've been just been doing lots of MMA training and um, mm. a lot of my grappling was just like um, me doing lots and lots of roles. Did you start no gi or? Yeah, so basically, yeah, I was more predominantly, like, I, I didn't even own a gi until, like, 2019. Yeah. Um, and that would have been, what, towards the end of 2019 or something like that, that I, that I decided, okay, you know, I might as well, if I'm going to spend all this time doing jiu-jitsu, and it was actually, you know, Dave that, that encouraged me, he was like, oh, you know, if you're going to spend all this time doing jiu-jitsu, you might as well just, you know, um, put the gi on and, and get a rank to go with it. Like, it's, it's I know it's not going to match, you know, where you're at, but it doesn't matter. Like, in the, in the long run, you're going to get there anyway. Mm. And so I have that uh, mentality about it anyway, so I don't really care. You know, like, belts don't really bother me. I'm not... Um, I'm not very phased about belt progression and all that sort of stuff. I'm more phased in technical ability, how do you put it together, you know, because, like, as you know, you know, when you do your comps, there's, there are blue belts that are not blue belt level, yeah. uh, and there are blue belts that are, like, significantly higher than blue belt level, right? Yeah. And it just really depends on who you come up against. So, it, like, it all reality is, and it all really doesn't mean anything in competition, especially if you're doing, like, Nogi Advanced and things like that, um, because you're coming up against the higher belts anyway. Mm. The only time it really matters is if you're doing a gi specific comp and then at the at the same time a lot of the times you know um if you want to compete at the international stage well an international level blue belt is very different to the hobbyist blue belt that generally trains in that you see in most gyms Mm. right so that's why for me it's like uh, when i look at belts it's like i don't i never really even ask anybody what belt they are anymore it's like as soon as i roll with somebody i know what level they're at and probably vice versa if they're experienced the moment that they roll with me they're going to know okay this guy knows something or he doesn't know something yeah <laughs> right yeah i think uh the way that ibjjf has uh the way kids uh can progress to adults belts is stupid what's like, that um well like say a kid my age right yep. well it's basically my position right now yeah i could start at seven yep. i can uh do competitions all those years go yep. Turn 16 and then, yeah, blue belt. Yep. Blue belt now. Yeah. So I can go in blue belt adult divisions, pop, compete against guys who've been training for like two to three years. Exactly. And um, it happens like everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Like there are just these, uh, you know, juvenile blue belts are just destroying, destroying adults. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, when realistically, they're probably like, you know, purple they're a belt, much higher high level. Le- high, yeah. high level purple belts or even at uh, so I was at Subversion the other day hmm. and like you look at the so the, the blue belts that completed there was I think three or four wait maybe more maybe it was five I can't remember it was three or five um, uh, people that had qu- gone through the qualifiers so hmm. Subversion qualifiers uh, they competed to basically be able to compete on the stage at, at Subversion hmm. and some of those matches were amazing matches like they were so fun to watch yeah. and I was like okay you know like these guys are meant to be blue belts or whatever but come on like let's be real uh, they're yeah. not rolling at a blue belt level. And that's why I say, like, in competition is really where you're going to see uh, what level somebody's going to be at. Mm. And then especially in, in, in MMA comp- competition, like, it doesn't really matter yeah. because there's so many other factors that go into it, whether it's uh, the, the person's striking ability, the person's takedown ability, the person's ability to defend takedowns, right? The match may never even get to the ground, mm. right? And then if it does, well, you're going to see who's got the better ground game, but not purely from a, a jiu-jitsu standpoint. You're going to see it from a, an MMA ground fighting standpoint mm. because it's very different when you add the punches and kicks and yeah it's crazy yeah. how a lot of jiu-jitsu guys think uh their jiu-jitsu will hold up and uh mma off just pure just jiu-jitsu mm. training it just it won't well even like, even the all. difference between gi and no gi right if you yeah. play a very gi heavy game mm. you know when it comes to no gi or you, it, you you lose a lot of your game like if you're a spider guard player mm. it's very difficult to translate spider guard into <laughs> yeah into well, no gi. well my uh because i'm so i love i love training gi yeah like i i love it um, my game in gi is dramatically different from my game in no gi. Yep. Because it's just like I I, uh, I like to play off my back. Yep. Uh, I like to submit and like you know uh, get grips from there and set up submissions. And yep. You just can't do that in no gi. No. Like the op- open guard and guard is just not the same with no gi. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's just dramatically different. Yeah. Um. No, fair enough. So then, okay. Um. So in. In primary school, like, uh, when you say you were the shy kid, you know, um, did, were, you, were you ever bullied in primary school or was it only when you got to high school? Oh, yeah. I was bullied, like, the, my whole... Up until, up until, like, after that video. Yeah. Came, like, after that, all that happened, then it completely stopped. Okay. So, but just... Because I, I, I started young... I was young for my year in yep. school. So, I was just small. 
Yeah. Like super small. Always. Yeah. So when you say you started young, so what, uh, when you started kindy, were you, were you four? Yeah. Yeah. I was okay. four years old. Yeah. Kindy. Yeah. Uh, I, I almost had to pr- repeat one year, actually. Oh. Yeah, like, I got to the end of the year in kindy and my whole, you know, like, the booklets they give out? Yep. My whole booklet was just scribbles. Because <laughs> I was just too young. I just didn't, <laughs> just wasn't there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and did you ever talk to your parents about it now? It's like, oh, what, what did you send me when I was I'm actually, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm actually kind of, like, I'm happy for it because I feel like I have a head start now. Like, I finished uh, high school when I was 17. Yep. So, um, you know, as of... If I was enrolled at the right time, I'd be in high school right now. Yeah, I'd be uh, preparing for HSC, and yeah. you know, oh, it's dreadful. Like when I last year, um, I spent like months off training just yeah. because of uh, HSC. Have to do HSC. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. My parents were so um, just so strict about that, like me doing it. Yeah, um, they're gonna make me go to uni. Yeah, um, up until a couple of years, like re. Uh, a couple of years ago when I explained that I wanted to go ahead with uh, all this training. Mm. Um, and my uni would be, you know, going overseas to go train or, you know, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. to, to train. Yep. Yeah. So, okay, we, we, we'll get to that because yeah. uh, there's more questions that I want to ask about that. But um, yeah, it's, it's always, uh, so I was, a, I was a young kid as well. Like mm. when I went into, when I started um, kindy, I would have been four, just turning five. Um, and I think it's a, you know, I think nowadays there's a lot of parents that want to hold their kids back, mm. thinking that, oh, at least they'll be more mature when they start. But I think there's something to that, you know, that when you're, if you start school when you're younger, yes, it's more challenging and it's probably, it probably requires you to grow a lot more in a shorter period of time. Mm. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think, you know, if anything, that sort of teaches you uh, a bit more resilience and, and longer term, you know, you sort of uh, develop yourself slightly differently to, to the other kids, you know, obviously being the smaller kid, right? Mm. So... Um, what, what, out of curiosity, like, what did they did they just bully you for being small, or was there anything else that they were trying to bully you about? Like, were you into nerdy things, or? Yeah, but well, yeah, I was a bit of a nerd in primary school. I was like, I, I, uh, I collected like Pokemon cards and stuff yep. like that. Um, but yeah, I feel like being small was the main thing. May, like, um, you know, not bully for being small, but just because I am small, then it's like available to. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But um, yeah, it was just yeah, it was ruthless. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Was there any times that you, you know, uh, ended up in tears over it? Yeah, or, yeah? of course. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you, and did, so I guess like what I'm curious about is um, how did you try and approach it? So I guess like do you tell your teachers? Did you tell your parents? Like I guess how, how did you deal with it? Um, and this is before you obviously had jiu-jitsu or anything else, right? Well, I had, I had some. Yeah. Like the thing is with starting jiu-jitsu young, it's like yeah. you have a bad session, you could just step out for a, like a year, yeah. you know. Um, so I had a little bit, you know, and of course I'd try to resort to it. But, you know, there's a point where you can be so small and, and weak and, uh, you know, they're in a year above or two years above you. They can just put, you know, just push you to the floor, you yeah. know. Um, but yeah, the... Yeah, I, I couldn't really use it that much, but yeah. I just kind of had to accept it. But, there were, you know, of course there were some times where, you know, it probably worked out for me yeah. um, to, to stand up for myself. But yeah. Yeah. So then, uh, like, so, yeah, did you, did you try and approach the teachers about it or did you tell your parents about it? Yeah, of course you can. Uh, I tried to approach the teachers and... What did they say? Oh, you know, like, they, they'll do something about it, but, like, nothing ever comes to, like, comes to it. Like, it, it's just, a, I feel like it's almost impossible to stop. Yeah. You know, it's just always going to happen. It's just part of, a part of school, I yeah. feel like, for some people. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's a very hard, I feel like it's a very hard area to, mm. to manage. Yeah, I think, I think in some schools, it's, it, it becomes, like, a, almost like a cultural thing, you know, because, like, if you're at certain schools where it might be a little bit rough, it's, like, the older students always bully the younger students. Mm. So then, like, when those seven and eight, year seven, eight students get older, they do the same thing. Mm. Um, it's not like that yeah, in every school. Yeah, it's almost school, like uh, they think it's, like, revenge for yeah. what they did. Well, it's, it's a rite of passage, mm. right? But then, you know, like, and I'll, I'll show you this story. So, uh, so when I went to high school, it was sort of similar for our grade. I don't know why. Um, and, and maybe it happened to the other grades as well, but our grade... When we were year seven, we used to get picked on by all the older grades. And it basically um, carried on until probably like midway through year eight or year nine. I can't remember which year it was now, but there was this massive fight where uh, one of my mates punched one of the kids in the grade above in the, in the head. Mm. And then it became like this thing, you know, oh, you know, on Wednesdays after school sport, they're going to be fighting on the top oval. Yeah. Half the school's there. 
you know, okay, it's a one-on-one fight. Okay, we'll let it go, let them fight. And then my mate got winded. So I think he got, copped a knee to the midsection or something like that. He was winded. And, um, and then, you know, we were, like, saying, okay, fight's over, fight's over. Like, he's lost, so what? Okay? And then um, people still, like, the people in the older grades still wanted to keep going. Oh, yeah. And so then, uh, um, yeah, then it, I, probably my fault, but... Uh, I grabbed one of the, the kids that was trying to keep instigating it from like year 11 or something and here I am like this little year 8 kid grabbed this, grabbed this kid in year 11 and oh, I yeah. just grabbed him by the shirt and I started punching him in the head yeah. um, and all, all I, like basically I was like head down and just like just swinging my one hand because I had the other hand in the shirt and I was like if I let go of this shirt I won't know where he is but if I hold on to the shirt I'll, I'll yeah. know exactly where he is and I'll just keep punching so I just kept punching and then I was like head down because there's like all these guys on top of me and then, and then all my mates had jumped in. They're all pulling off everyone. And then, um, shout out to my friend Heng. Um, he 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 was pulling off one of the kids from me. And then he's he's grabbed me. But when he's grabbed me, I thought it was somebody else. And then I've gone. I've turned around to punch him. Mm. And I realised, oh shit, it's Heng. And then I'm like, but I couldn't stop my hand. But I've like managed to slow it down enough. So I sort of like pillow fisted him. And yeah. I'm just like, <laughs> and he just looked at me like he was, what are you doing? Because <laughs> yeah, right. Heng was yeah. big. Like Heng was Heng was bigger than yeah. much bigger than I was back then. But yeah, like thinking about uh, you know, uh, when I was in like year seven. Eight, like so 12 13 um kids are like much older like mm. year 10 like mu- like and i just think of how i was when i was that age in mm. that year and i'm just like what the fuck like how how are they you know like going after like such young like mm. you know hitting such young kids yeah. like it's just insane to me yeah um it's really like they're real cowards you know well um, th- see this is the thing like insane. even though our grade got bullied so after that that was the end of the bullying for us Mm. You know, um, after that, we never got bullied again. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, we just sort of got left alone after that. Mm. And But for our grade, we never bullied any of the grades below us. Yeah. Right? So it was just one of those weird things where, you know, I think, you know, if, if, if it was other people in that situation, maybe they become the bullies, you know. But for us, we never wanted to become the bullies. Like, we just didn't become bullies after that. And then, uh, as far as I know, like, there wasn't really much of that style of bullying. There might have been other styles of bullying at school, yeah. but not where it's like other older grades picking on the younger grades. Mm. So... Let's talk a little bit about that video then. Yeah, <laughs> you went, you've gone a little bit viral. Yeah, <laughs> um, well, it's been it's been shared of like for years. Yeah, and so uh, that happened about uh, five years ago, and it's just been shared like uh, it shared like a week after it first happened. Yeah, and then I think it I think it was the first one was on Reddit or something. Yeah, and then that one was like a little like you know went a little bit viral like because it, it like it's an interesting school like it's not a usual school fight yeah. video. Yeah. Um, by then I was already national champion in jiu-jitsu for my age yep. um, I had no striking at all <laughs> um, that's actually c- because of that video my dad let me start Muay Thai oh really yeah um, but you know it's like no, you know, no sparring and yeah. of course I just kept pushing it kept pushing it because yeah. you know, if it's truly what you want to do like, you're going to be able to do it yeah. soon um, but yeah it's been shared oh, like dozens of times so like okay this. well let, let, let's talk a little bit about it so there's obviously, you know, a bit of a lead up to that video, right? Like, yeah. so this this other kid was probably was it him and his friends, or was it just him? Was it just an individual? Just him. Just yeah. him. And for whatever reason, he saw you as a bit of a soft target. Yeah. So, what you saw in that video it happened maybe three, four other times, just without the choke at the end. Yeah. You know, um, he'd come up behind me and like, you know, headlock me and stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, like, I'd always go for the... Like, I'd, I'd always just try to take him down, you yeah. know. He's a lot bigger than me, yeah. stronger. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was... Because, because of that, uh, there were multiple incidents reported uh, by teachers of him attacking me unprovoked. Mm. That's the reason why I wasn't suspended for it, and he was. Mm. Um, so yeah, I have seen I've I've seen all the the comments saying like you know that I I look like the you know the instigator and that, mm. um, but of course you know like how are you gonna know what happened before yeah. the video started? That's right. Um, even the the weeks before the days before, um, they just have no idea. Mm. You know? And yeah, I get it. Like it looks like it, but I feel like in even you can see in that video like I do not look like I'm I want to get into a fight at mm. all. Um, I was pushing her out of, uh, you know, just clear. Like, I just wanted him to, to get away from me. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we're, I'm on good terms with him now. So, yeah. you know, it happened five years ago. We were, like, 12, 13. Yeah. Um, so, how, was, was he in one of the older grades or? Uh, he was in my same. He was in my Same year. grade. Yeah. He's that much bigger than you. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, cause just because being that uh, a year younger. Yeah. Um, like, 
almost every kid was bigger than me. Yeah. You know, in year eight, I was probably like 35, 40 kilograms. Mm. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it was tough. So, so did they know that you were uh, like you into jujitsu back then? Or yeah, they knew like they knew of it. They didn't really care. But once they once that happened, then it was like okay, yeah, like he can he defend can, himself. Yeah, he can do <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, because um, it was pretty wild. Like the, I think you can see the teacher at the breaking up at the end. Like she thought I was trying to, because she like if you see another kid trying to choke another kid unconscious. Yeah. You're not thinking like, oh, it's, it's all like it's safe, safe here. Yeah. Like he'll wake up She's after freaking out. Yeah. yeah. She thought I was trying to kill him. Yeah. So she was screaming at me after that video ended. She was screaming at me. Yeah. But um, yeah, that video almost got deleted. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, my. So who took it? One of my mates did. Yeah. Um, but uh, all the guys in that video were all uh, his his uh, older brother's friends. They were all just watching it. Yeah. Um. I was very lucky they didn't step in or anything. Yeah. Because um, I feel like, you know, even though, like, jiu-jitsu is very effective. Yeah. Um, but in a more than... All, yeah, more when there's more than one guy yeah. there, like, it's just, it's very, it's kind of dangerous, you yeah. know. Um, but, yeah, so one of my ma- my mates took the video uh, and he was uh, standing there with another guy because the, this teacher was trying to, you know, press him to delete the video. Mm. And right before, like, right before she walked out the door to come get it off him, uh, he just air dropped it to me straight away, <laughs> but yeah, I had even I didn't even know what happened. Like I was asked my friends, like you know, like did like did I win that? Did I win or like what happened? And yeah, you're in shock. Yeah, yeah, because like, uh, it was weird. I do remember him like landing that ride on me. Yeah, and I just saw stars. Like my jaw was hurting for like four days after that. Yeah, um, I feel like it was probably the hardest I've ever been hit. Yeah. Um, and I just, uh, I just like switched on, man. Like I just, uh, I, cir- I circled around, and then I, yeah. um, all the, everything I did in that was stuff that I, like just a full jiu-jitsu. sequence, yeah. that uh, like a self defense thing in uh, jiu jitsu. Mm. You know, the feint for the like going up high, mm. then shooting down low, <laughs> coming on top, put the frame on the head, break the headlock. Um, it was very textbook. Like it's exactly what I learned in jiu jitsu. Mm. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, it's very effective. Mm. Uh, so then. Uh, like I guess what 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 happened after the fight? Like did 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 you guys talk or? Yeah, I talked to him right after. And was um, was he okay? Lunchtime. Was he angry? What <laughs> was? Yeah, uh, it was very, um, it was very good the way he took it. I feel like because uh, there were a lot of uh, lots of different kids who he, you know, he bullied. Yeah. You know, he he messed with, um, and I feel like it completely stopped after that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we were talking like at uh. I think the lunchtime right after mm. and um he'd already been suspended mm. and um yeah we just talked he said sorry to me and um yeah but he, he took it very well mm. yeah. see one of the things that i always think about is that a lot of the times when there are kids who uh, are naughty or playing up like that like mm. and bullying other people like there could be something at home there could be something in their uh, in their lives that you see outside of that you don't see at, you know because it's outside of school mm. that um causes them to be that way yeah whether it's like you know um they might have a broken family at home. I'm not saying this is him, but I'm just saying they might have a broken family at home or they've got somebody who might be bullying them or abusing them at home, right? Mm, I think that might have been the, the case. I think I knew yeah. a little bit there. Okay, yeah. well, let's, we, yeah, like we don't have to talk specifically yeah. about him. But, um, you know, and the reason why I say that is because, you know, a lot of the times when people see people getting bullied, of course, it's really easy to go and um, get angry at the bully, right? Mm. And we go, oh, this kid's wrong and blah, 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 blah. But we don't necessarily think about... And humanize the aspect that hey, they might their kid they're a kid too, yeah, right. And something might be happening in their life that is causing them to act out in this particular way because they're obviously not in control of whatever is going on at home. And then now they're they're trying to find an opportunity to take control and mm. exert their control on somebody else. So, you know, uh, it's it's a strange sort of feeling to have because obviously you know most of the time when you get bullied you go fuck that guy you yeah. know fuck him you know like I'm gonna kill that guy. oh yeah well I hate right? it sorry yeah. language but like <laughs> that's generally how people think you know when you when you get bullied right yeah. you, you want to kill that person mm. right why is he making my life so miserable why is this happening right that especially if you're the bullied person like it takes a pretty big person to be able to go and um, realize that hey okay maybe like you know once the beef is settled or whatever the case may be to be able to turn around and say hey you know like, I don't actually wish any bad on this person mm. right like yeah okay you bullied me, you treated me like shit, fair, okay? And I've got my, you know, I've gotten one back on you. Um, 
but you know I hope whatever's going on in your life you can sort out mm. because at the end of the day like where does it lead if you just you know st- keep going tit for tat right like you just if you keep going tit for tat like you know okay you get one over him for whatever reason he he comes back then you know and it escalates like that's how people die right mm. like it escalates because he comes back and he brings a pole yeah and then and then you get bashed and then you bring come back and you bring a knife mm. right and then somebody's getting stabbed well, like that's that's basically what happens in, yeah. in, in well the even even that exact uh that exact right like it was uh it's dangerous and so, like if i if that that right hand was any any harder than it was yeah it could have iced me yeah and, uh, and like you're on concrete. On concrete like yeah. yeah my head hits the floor and i'm i'm done yeah you know? um or, or if i'm not dead then like a brain injury mm. you know um yeah it's super like it's super dangerous mm. you know um just yeah, school fights, any any fight, like uh, fights that aren't regulated. Yeah, yeah it's so dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing though. Like once yeah. you start training, you're sort of like, okay, if somebody wants to fight, no worries. Come to the gym. Come, yeah. come come to the gym and we can play. You know, like yeah. <laughs> or even on grass as well. Just set it up on grass. <laughs> it's so much safer. Um, yeah, It'll be like one of those Kimbo slice, you know, backyard pools. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just seeing fights on concrete. I'm just like, what is going? What are you like, doing? What is going on? Like, yeah. um, they've just upped the risk so much. Yeah. you know. Um, yeah yeah all right so in high school you know like aside from the bully, bullying aside like I guess were you still the shy quiet kid in high school as well or yeah yeah in a, yeah in a sense it's like uh, did you start coming out of your shell yeah I feel like in high school I started to change a bit more yeah. you know um, I feel like with everyone everyone kind of changed yeah. like from primary school to high school um, yeah I, I still was like softer you know yeah I wasn't tough you know uh, so we, okay, let's let's clarify a little bit on this, right? Because when people say that they're soft, like, what do you, do you do? You feel like you've had to toughen up, so to speak, or do you feel like you just had to ch- uh, t- uh, channel a different part of you to find, I guess, some resilience? And 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 part of the reason why I say that is because, uh, so when I was a kid, and I see this in my own son as well, right? So. An easy way to manipulate other people when you're a kid is to, you know, you have a, little, a few tears and people leave you alone, mm. right? Whether it's your parents, your siblings, your friends, whatever. You know, oh, I don't like this game. Have a few tears, put on the waterworks or have, you know, have a little bit of a hissy fit. Mm. And then people will sometimes pander to you. And then you identify who are the ones that pander to you. And then, like, it happens for parents all the time. Yeah. You know, like their kid gets away with um, having a sulk or whatever and you pander to them. And then for some reason you go, oh, why is their behaviour keep why does it keep getting worse mm. right because you keep pandering to that behavior that they're offering but then the moment you start to put a wall up and say hey hang on a second okay we can do whatever you want but you're going to calm down first you're going to do this you're going to do that you're going to meet me at these steps before we can look at the steps that you want right so when you say you were soft was it that uh you found a way that you could sort of you know get out of things um by you know expressing your discontent with them or and, and so I guess, you know, in, in becoming tougher, you just, it just means that you don't really express that discontent anymore. Mm. Or was the softness like you actually just really felt like you're a weak person? Yeah, I felt like I was weak. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I feel like, I felt like, you know, kids in uh, older years, like when I was just year seven, year eight, uh, you know, you could like shove me around too hard and I'd just burst into tears, you know. <laughs> um, Did you have any siblings? Yeah, I had yeah. two two younger sisters. Two younger sisters. Yeah, one one does lots of one started jujitsu when I when I started. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, she's still going now. I'm hoping we can get her training with Renata. Okay. Yeah. Come to MMA. Yeah. Does she want to do MMA though? Yeah. She yeah. just started uh, asking me. Re- I think after my um after fight your fight. Up, yeah, fight up an XFC. <laughs> yeah. Because um, I think uh, you know, even a lot of kids with uh, you know good jiu-jitsu, they can do so well in IMAF mm. because IMAF is body body punch, body punch, yeah. body punches only. Um, but yeah, jiu-jitsu can like hold up well in, mm. in IMAF. Well, that's the reason why. Like when uh, I was just training straight Muay Thai and jiu-jitsu, no mm. MMA training, mm. I could hop into IMAF uh, tournaments and win. Yep. Because uh, I just feel like it's so. I feel like any junior IMAF. Uh, match it always turns into a jujitsu or wrestling yeah. match. Always. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So when it came to uh, you getting over the softness or yeah. the weakness, so to speak, like what? How do you? What was the process? Mm. Um, mainly through training. Mm. I feel like um, uh, just change. Like once I could build that confidence up, and uh, 
you know, get over like all that like nervousness. I feel like I just I feel so uh, so much more power like powerful. You mm. know? Um, yeah, and I just feel everything. If I've done not, like none of this, I'd be a completely different person. Yeah, I feel like. Um, but yeah, I'm so grateful for you know getting into what I do. You know? Yeah. So then let's also switch gears a little bit and talk about injuries, mm. right? So I think the biggest. Um, worry that people have especially with their kids doing martial arts and things like that is injuries yeah um can you talk us through you know did you have did you get any injuries through jiu-jitsu training yeah so uh, comps and things like that yeah i had uh one of my worst injuries to date was uh, i had two, i think it was two two stre- tre- stress fractures in my bilateral lumbar lum- lum- lumbar spine or something I, Ooh, yeah so yeah it was terrible uh because i'm a heavy guard player yeah um there's this pass where you can get du- double unders under the under the legs, and mm. then you kind of uh, you push the, the legs over the top of them and stack them. Mm. And I believe it was from that, because um, all of a sudden, just like after after training that night, um, I just had like weird pain in my back, and I woke up for Muay Thai the next morning. I couldn't finish the session, mm. um, and then that took me out for three months. Yeah, yeah. So that was probably the worst like the worst injury I've had today, and. Uh, but through that uh, recovery process, I kind of learned that I need to respect the injury and respect the recovery process. Because mm. um, I feel like when I get injured now, I can uh, deal with it very well. Mm. You know, like when I had that injury, like I was just itching to get like training in. You know, so I'd always be pushing. Like, you know, I think for the first the first uh, six weeks, it was nothing at all, like mm. zero. Um, you know, even going for like a long walk would flare up my back and wow. um yeah it was it was dreadful but and uh yeah going through that i you know i tried to train and you know i do like these long stretching sessions to try and like ease it and so i could do some training and then um you know i was only making it worse for myself and i'm glad that i could i uh, realize that because mm. um, i feel like you know i get injured now uh, i accept it and i recover uh, I recover it well, do whatever I can, um, and then, you know, recover and come back better. Yep. So when it comes to a stress factor in your lower spine, you can't really do anything about that, can you? They can't put in a cast. Yeah. Nothing. You basically just yeah. got to take time off and let it... Yeah, it's just yeah. Uh, like physio. So we got like an MRI, MRI done. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then uh, after we got the MRI done, uh, you know, we saw and we... we uh, you know, knew what the injury was, and yeah. um, the thing is, oh, we, when we went to like these different GPs, like my, I didn't come with my dad for one of them. Yeah. And one of the GPs told my dad that I'd never be able to train again, <laughs> and he didn't even, he couldn't even tell me because he knew like I would be just, Devastated. yeah, I would be dev, like I devastated, like I just wouldn't know what to think. Um, so lucky he didn't tell me that, but <laughs> um, yeah, so he got a second opinion, went to another GP, and then uh, the strength and conditioning gym that i train with uh athletes authority mm-hmm. they uh they hooked me up with a very good sports doctor and uh once we went to them they got me like very like done very well and like they gave me some you know great information on on what my train like going back into training should be like mm. um even at athletes authority they have a massive uh physio facility now mm. but um back at the their old gym they had phys- physios there but it wasn't like a massive facility and uh they covered the whole treatment when mm. i was there so um yeah they part of that uh them as well is why i recovered so well and i was able to get back into training so easily just after three months you yeah. know and i feel like a spine like a spine injury is uh, on the serious side you yeah know? um H- how did you find them like i guess um were yeah you one of my my old jiu-jitsu coach knew i uh, was connected with one of them and uh they were very the uh, like a small gym at the time mm. Um, so yeah, I start. I joined up there, and I was doing sessions at like five thirty a.m. <laughs> um, and I just became like, it became uh, like it started with my dad waking me up every single morning to to go to there, and I was just, you know, I couldn't get out of bed, and then I don't know, some, something just switched, and then, uh, you know, I was waking up, I was waking him up with a, you know, with a coffee ready for him, and um, I just became absolutely obsessed with just getting training and just waking up early. Um, you know, and getting in as, in as much training as I could, mm. and uh, yeah, I've been going to going there ever, ever since. Yeah, wow. Um, so then, so what would so your school day back then would basically look like? Wake up, at, you know, before five thirty, get in. Oh, yeah, school was. Oh, 
It was terrible. Yeah. So talk, yeah. talk me through. I'm curious what the yeah. timetable looked like. So, um, yeah. So peak training in, in school was I'd wake up at five, uh, no, 4 a.m. Mm-hmm. I'd get ready for, to go to Athletes Authority or whether it was uh, Muay Thai. Um, uh, I'd, get, I'd get to the gym. I'd do my session. And then sometimes from there, sometimes my dad would take me back home. Then I'd go to school with uh, my siblings. Mm. But um, sometimes I'd, I'd start, I want, because I needed to stay longer. Like I needed to get at least an hour and 30 in the gym. Mm. Um, so I'd, I'd stay there, uh, get my session done, get changed, go to school, sleep all day through school. It was impossible <laughs> to stay away. I'm telling you, it's impossible <laughs> to stay away. I was sleeping through... Uh, so like so many different lessons, um, but you know, then there was like some some teacher, would, some teachers would like force me to stay awake, yeah. you know, because it is like it's rude, you know. Yeah. If they're teaching, I'm just got my head down on the desk. Um, but yeah, like didn't they ever complain to your parents and be like, "What are you? What's he doing? Why is he? Yeah, why is he well, so tired?" No, I'd tell them. I'd tell them. Like I'd say, like I was up at you know four five, five a.m. four a.m. this morning, like going to train, <laughs> and uh, like some of them would respect it and say, "Yeah, okay," like um. Um, there are some teachers who just would let me sleep, um, but yeah, there was a solid uh, like period of time where I was just sleeping throughout school. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd go like a whole English period just to sleep, learning nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just so like it just didn't matter to me at all. Like I didn't care that I was, uh, you know, just uh, walk around school like a zombie. Like a zombie. Yeah, because I just wanted to train in the afternoon and the and the morning. Yeah, you know, um, but yeah, it was dreadful though. It so then, so then, <laughs> so then after school, um, what time would you start training? And then, how, like, when, when would you do your homework and dinner? And what time yeah, would you no, go to bed? No time for homework. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I get home from school and have like a quick nap if I could. Mm. Um, I get tra- like the train like training would always be like um, past like five p.m. or so. Mm. So I get down to whether it was Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu and train for about two, two, three hours of uh, of that. And then um, I'd get home and I try to get to bed as early as I could because I had to wake up at such an early time. Mm. But um, it just it just becomes so hard. Like yeah. you know, there were times where you know I'd fall asleep at like one a.m. and have to get up at four, but I just didn't care. Yeah, you know, because I knew. Um, I knew I just had to get up. Like whatever I had to do in the, the morning, I'd always book uh, like the, you know, because you had to book the sessions to go mm. to them. I'd always book the night before because if I knew I booked it, I'd have to be 100% getting up and getting ready to go. Yeah. Um, but I also just loved it. Like I just purely just, I loved it. You know, getting, that, getting up that early and then, you know, getting a session done while, while everyone's asleep or, you know, walking out of the gym while everyone's walking in to start their session was just, it was at like, insane to me it was such a great feeling what what did your mum say about it <coughs> um you know she th- like she thought it was good that i'm like i'm trying like i'm trying, trying to be I'm, disciplined yeah and like i'm i'm doing all this stuff on my own accord um, oh, well. but um yeah the, s- the school results were dreadful yeah yeah so well, how did how did you go in the hsc i got a mystery mark oh you got a mystery mark yeah okay not too good yeah, yeah. um it, that, and that was even when I was uh, I spent all that time off. Uh, I could still go to the gym and stuff uh, just to lift weights, but you know, coming uh, coming here, yeah, um, you know, it's like a two hour train ride up mm. here and chill it, two hour train ride back. Yeah, so it just became like because my parents knew how long it took me to get to training. Um, they just said it's not time efficient. You know, you're spending four hours on a train. Time. Yeah, yeah, travel time for you know a one hour thirty two hour session. Mm. It's just not not worth it. So. Um, yeah, that was hard to hard to get over. Because mm. um, uh, right up upon that time, I was coming back from the IMAF World Championships. Mm. Um, so yeah, I had to spend a long time off. Um, but you know, I came back. You know, <laughs> next year, um, it was like hard to get back. Like, I feel like once you once you're on that roll of just like getting up every single morning, training, mm. training in the the Arvo, um, you get onto a roll where it's just kind of fluent. Um, yeah, it's I feel routine. like yeah. The the more you do it, uh, the better you're able to recover as well. Mm. Um, you know, once I step back in, I tried to go right back into it. Um, and after like the second second day of doing it, my body was just wrecked. Mm. Um, like every muscle in my body hurt. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, I had to, to ease back into it, you know. Mm. But um, if you really get like, if you, I can two weeks maybe. If you if you uh, really dedicate yourself for two weeks, just getting up every morning, training every afternoon, then um, you can get into that fluency of yeah. just training every single day. It's and discipline. It's not, yeah, yeah, and it's not even, uh, you know, I, f- I was doing it, uh, you know, training like 25 hours a week. Um, and I just didn't even feel like it was that hard, mm. you know, because after doing it for so long, you just get to this point where it's fluent. Yeah. Um, and you're able to recover so well and you adapt to that lifestyle. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very good way to be. Yeah. I, I, you know, that adaptability is, is such an amazing thing. Like, I think uh, when people go into, like, say, full time work and they're working a desk job, as mm. an example, they don't realize, you know, uh, that their body is now adapting to just being seated for, say, eight hours a day. Mm. Right. And so when it, is when your body's adapting to being seated for eight hours a day, it's like, okay, now your physiology is changing because, you know, the way what you're activating and what you're using when you're sitting down is very different to when you're standing. Yeah, that's, that's why is unimaginable to me. Yeah. yeah. But, like, you know, people don't, people don't think about it. And then they go, uh, like, they might do some sports and things like that, and they go, oh, why do I feel so tight? Or, you know, like, why, why is this muscle hurting or whatever? And it's like, because your, your body's... I feel like it makes you prone to injury. It, yeah, yeah. It, it does. Because, you know, your body's going to adapt to what you make it do the most. Mm. So if, as an example, you spend all your day on your feet, well, then, you know, you become very good at being on your feet the whole day that you probably find sitting uncomfortable, mm. right? And then, and then the people that sit all day, they get to the point where they can't imagine standing for two, three hours, mm. right? And yeah, so yeah, your body becomes more, it adapts to being able to sit down better. Yeah, you know? yeah. exactly how you use it, yeah. right? So, you know, I, I discovered the same thing, you know, when I was, um, uh, when I was working one of, my, one of the corporate jobs at uh, Toyota Head Office. Uh, it was pretty cool because we, we had an on-site gym and so I used to live on the other side of Sydney, so I, was, I used to live in the hills. Oh, yeah. And I was travelling to Kangba every day. So that was like an hour and 15, hour and 30, depending on traffic. So I used to wake up basically to try and beat peak hour traffic. So I'd, I'd wake up at 5, get straight in the car. That's bit like, so 6 p.m.? Yeah, say from 6, yeah. 6 a.m. onwards. Yeah, oh, 6, yeah, 6, 6 to 9, yeah. yeah. Uh, or probably more like 6 to 10 nowadays. But So I used to get up and um, have an alarm set for just like uh, 4.50 or something like that. Mm. Um, literally have my car packed the night before, wake up, jump in the car, drive and just like slowly over that hour and 15 wake up in the car mm. um, yeah, right. then get to work and then first thing i do like i'm still in my pjs but like i just like for my pjs i just wear like a, a shirt that i could train in and some shorts or whatever oh yeah and then just go straight to the gym do an hour in the gym have a shower then get dressed and then i'm at my workstation by you know eight something yeah right and then and so then it's like you sort of get into a bit of a flow where it's like okay i'm gonna do that in the morning and then at lunch at lunchtime, if I get a lunch break, you know, I'll do half an hour in the gym and spend, you know, 15 minutes eating or whatever. So, you know, as soon as, soon as I'm going to take a break, okay, boom, off to the gym, half an hour session, come back, eat for 15 minutes and, and then, then it was night and then work into the afternoon and then go to training at night time. Mm. So then, like, you know, when I first started doing that, I was like, oh, it's getting pretty sore, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, you, you know, especially if you're doing weights or anything like that and you go, oh, it's body's, body's feeling it. But then, you know, after you do two weeks of it, your recovery gets faster. Everything just seems to flow a little bit better. Yeah. Um, and then it's like, oh, okay, you know, like I can actually keep this up. Um, but then, you know, I think there's always a, a point of diminishing returns, right? Like mm. the, the moment that you go too far over it where you might have gone too heavy or you've done too much and then it's like, okay, that's when you're now prone to injury. Yeah. And you've got to be careful of that, you know, what's that tipping point? Yeah. It's different for everybody, but, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to find that balancing point, right? Because... Yeah, a rest day is, uh, it's like, Mandatory. Yeah. You have to have a rest there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is, it's super interesting how you can get to that point of fluency yeah. um, with training. Yeah. You know, from what you th- think is like going to be impossible, like it's gonna, you're going to have to drag yourself through it. Mm. It beca- gets just, you get over this hill and then it's just so smooth mm. and you, uh, you feel like it's easy. Like mm. for, at least for me, I felt like it was easy. Yeah. You know, getting up every morning, uh, training like five hours a day just became easy. Mm. Um, yeah. So, so now, you know, I guess you, you sort of find yourself trying to establish a new routine, right? Because you don't have school. Mm. Uh, are you working at the moment? Yeah. Yes. I, I work up at uh, my jiu-jitsu gym. So I coach okay. uh, just the kids to adults on yep. Sundays. Um, then I assist. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's bringing in good my, my What I want to do with this money is uh, save up and just uh, spend it on trips to go, like, well, I'm going to Thailand on yep. April, uh, April 3rd. Okay. So very soon. Uh, I'm going to be up there for a month. Yep. And that's all money that I've earned from coaching jiu jitsu. Yep. So, doing a training camp over there? Yeah. Yep. Mm, so, which gym are you going to go to? I'm going to AK. AK. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it's going to be wild. Yep. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, my my dad will be coming with me for the first oh, week. Oh, really? So, yeah, and then if I get settled in and it's all right, because I know the gyms in Thailand can be a bit, you know, they can be a bit rowdy. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, there are a lot of, you know, kind of dodgy stuff that happens, <laughs> with, you know, with the spot. Because, like, people from everywhere, yeah. like, are coming to those gyms. Mm. Um, you know, I heard a sto- uh, story once about, um, uh, you know, you know Ray? Mm. Yeah, uh, w- w- another f- fighter he, you know, he trains with. Um, went up there once. Um, he's sitting in the in the AK, like the same gym that I'm going to, mm. um, and all the like fighters are sparring. And um, these two Brazilian guys, uh, one of them was uh, sparring with uh, another guy there, and then all like they're just kind of you know pitter patter just sparring. And then he was looking down. I don't know what he was doing. He wasn't watching. He just hears like this massive smack, like a tree branch breaking, mm. um, and he lifts his head up, and this guy is out cold on the floor and the Brazilian guys just walking around just you know and then um, the the Thai coach is like you know he waves wave to some guys they walk over to the guy and they're dragging his body outside <laughs> trying to wake him up and then he points at uh, one of Ray's uh, fighters that he trains with and he's like you go with him yeah and um, he gets with him and then they're sparring and because like if you just see that right like right in front of you yeah. you know, I think you're not you're gonna be like you're gonna be rattled. Like yeah. so, once he stepped in there with him, you know he just had to like cover up. Like because this guy just knocked someone out cold yeah. in, in sparring. It's just it's probably not the yeah. smartest way to train. You know, yeah. like it's one of those of things. Course, yeah. There's I, so many different mentalities, right? But <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. There's lots of uh, I feel there's lots of uh, stuff saying that you should never spar like that. Yeah. Um, I think you know uh, it serves a point. So I guess from my experience, like the only thing I would say is that uh, if you've never had the intensity of aspiring hard, then you need to experience that a few times and it's better that you experience it before you actually get in the cage or get in the ring to mm. experience proper competition. Yeah, you need to feel the... You need to feel power. Like, you need to feel shots, yeah. you know. Um, right? Yeah. And, but once you're comfortable with the idea of getting hit, then I think it's more about, okay, you're not going to build technical proficiency if you go on full clip mm. because you'll never get the opportunity to, to test that timing, to test, you know, the tempo or, or switch up your shots because you're always worried about the, you know, defending, right? Um, so, you know, when you're more playful and when you can, you know, when it's not as hard, you can now play around with different attacks and work out, okay, how do I slip this in? Because, you know, if it in- involves like a specific head movement, right, you don't want to be doing that when somebody's going full clip and, and you run into a punch. Mm. You want to be doing that when it's light and then you go, okay, I can't move that way. Yeah. Uh, I need to try it this way. And then that's how you actually develop, you know, your skill set and things like that. Mm. But yeah, like there, there's definitely uh, uh, something important about it, especially when it comes to if you've never experienced uh, that sort of adrenaline dump before, you know, I think a lot of people haven't, you know, when there's confrontation, when there's conflict and, yeah. you know, and you realise, hey, the stakes are pretty high here. You know, you get you eat this shot, it's going to fuck and hurt yeah. right so when those stakes are high like uh, you know i, I don't know I, I, everybody's different but I, I like it because like you know i can zone in but then it's like okay you, 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 if somebody's giving it to you you got to give it back to yeah right and i'm i'm a bit nice in the sense that i don't like to give it back in, in inspiring like it's that's not the whole point of inspiring like it's we're here to to, to play mm. uh, and i'd rather play than go hard in the gym and save it for you know competition yeah so yeah well um when I first started up Muay Thai, I became obsessed with sparring. Like, <laughs> I, I wasn't even turning up to the pad session. I just wanted, to, just was coming to spar. Want to bang. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the funny thing is, uh, uh, I said uh, that my, my dad didn't want me to spar at all. Yeah. Um, so the thing is, like, when I, I, when I started, like, this was around the lockdown. Yeah. Like, uh, so there were no spectators in the gym. Mm. So I was going to these sessions without my dad knowing. Because if he saw, if he saw any of those sessions, if he saw any of those adult, adults that I was sparring with and the way that they were smacking me, he would have pulled me out that night. Yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, I was, I was. Shout like, out to dad. Yeah. You're gonna know now. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late, dad. Yeah. He's 18. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for a long, long time, like uh, you know, he did not want me to to do sparring or. Mm. You know, because when I first started up, because he saw that video, like he saw, he saw and he saw me get cracked and, you know, how I was just kind of walking forward with my chin up like mm. this. Um, and uh, it's very clear from that, that I could have ended up in a much worse mm. situation if the punch was any harder. Mm. Like, as I said before, I could have been, I could have been done right yeah, there. on the concrete. Like, yeah. Uh, mm. My life could have been over. Mm. Um, so, yeah, he started me up with the, the Muay Thai, but 
you know, of course, no sparring. Because you know? mm. um, I, I think he was, you know, he's worried about the, the head trauma that yep. possible and, you know, starting that young as well. Yeah. Um, Do you worry about it? Um, yeah, I think about it sometimes, you know. <laughs> but it's like, you know, it's not too much of a, you know, is it a worry for any, any, any fighter, you know. Mm. Um, they don't, th- don't think about it too much, yeah. you know. Um, but working on, like, having your game, uh, you know, to try and not be hit is, is also a way to treat it, I yeah. feel like. Um, yeah. You know, especially my, uh, my game is very, you know, I want to go to the floor and yeah. try to submit you. So there's no, it's kind of eliminating a lot of the strike in there. Yeah. Um, and the potential danger. But mm. Yeah. Mm. Fair but that stuff is no joke, yeah. you know. Yeah, and, and this is the thing. Like, I think, you know, it's it's easy to laugh about it, you know, chew meat, hit style and go, oh, I got hit or yeah. whatever. But, like, when you – I think that's the thing, you know. I think when, when your chin starts to go, it doesn't – it never comes back. Yeah. Right? Like, there, there's plenty of examples of that in athletes that, you know, have just taken too much damage. Mm. It seems to be different for some people. Yeah. Like, but but more, more often than not, it's uh, – There's a point of no return. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I think when you're, when you're young and, like, you, if you take the appropriate time off, Mm. then you can recover and it won't be so much of an issue. Yeah. But, you know, getting knocked out, you know, after you've probably been knocked out three, four times, it's like things start to change. Yeah. What are the medical suspension time for? Uh, Depends on where, I think. Yeah. Some will give you three three months, some will give you six months. Like, this is the thing, like, especially when you're fighting interstate. So, obviously, we've got CSA here in New South Wales where things are documented. CSA? It's up to the doctor. Yeah. Yeah, so the doctor will tell you, you know, how long they, they want to suspend you for. Mm. Um, they'll assess the damage, you know, the ringside doctor or whatever. But, um, you know, this, this is the thing, like, there's this big thing about, you know, fighters going interstate. So, you know, at XSC, you go up to Queensland or whatever. Um, you, you're not getting your blue book signed because mm. it's, new, it's a New South Wales thing, provided you got your medicals, provided you got your... Um, your serologicals, your blood tests done. It's actually really funny uh, right. up in Queensland. I, <laughs> I didn't get any blood tests done. Oh, they uh, didn't ask yeah. you? Oh no! Well, we had to sign a thing that oh, we'll get it the next, like the next oh, week okay. after. But yeah, it's yeah. just so funny up in Queensland. Like, yeah. um, I was getting fights up there when I was, uh, you know, like sixteen. Yeah. Um, but it's just impossible. Like for, in NSW, fighting as a juvenile is yeah. impossible. Yeah. Um, because they have a, like they have a combat board in NSW which yep. restricts all juveniles uh, from like you know striking in the head. Yep. Um, and that's across all sports: mm. uh, boxing, MMA. Um, any any striking, but up in Queensland, there's nothing. Yeah, there's no combat board. Yeah, so there's no restrictions. Yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, it's very funny the way they deal with things up there. You yeah. know. Oh yeah, just sign this piece of paper saying you'll get it <laughs> next week, and it's all good. <laughs> I guess they were lenient because you know it's four days notice. Yeah. You know? um, but yeah. Yeah. So it it really depends on the on the doctors, but yeah, like fighters would. There'd be fighters that would go and fight in, say, Victoria or Queensland, and then, you know, they might get injured or whatever, but they've got another fight booked for, like, two or three weeks, and they'd still do it, mm. all right? Probably not the smartest thing to do. Like, you know, for them long-term, that's, that's probably not ideal, especially if you got knocked out or whatever. Mm. Um, can understand why people would choose to do that, but, you know, it's not the ideal in terms of what you should be doing. Uh, and it wouldn't happen if they had just stayed fighting in New South Wales, but, you know, you've got to go where the fights are. That's, mm. that's the reality of this game is, like, you know, if you've got an opportunity to fight anywhere, well... Yeah, you probably take it at this stage because you're trying to get your name out there. You're trying to build up your platform, yeah. and then it's like, okay, well, you know, then what do you do with it? And so I guess, you know, leading into that, um, how do you sort of see yourself making a career out of this? Like, is is it just purely out of the fighting? Is there other things that you, uh, that interest you that you want to do? Or like, I uh, guess, of course, I, I I do want my own gym one day. Yeah, you know, having and um, I know like oh maybe it should be like MMA, but I do want my own jujitsu gym. Yeah. You know? Um, I don't know why, but I, just because I started so young, I, I, I still train gi now. Yeah. I know I shouldn't, like I probably shouldn't be, it probably has no use for, because the end goal is MMA. Yep. Like I want to go forward with MMA. I want to mm. have a professional career in MMA and go as far as I can with it. Mm. Um, but yeah, I still love gi jiu-jitsu. Okay, let's, yeah. let's, let's digress a little bit. And I want to talk about the gi jiu-jitsu because obviously for you to feel that way, it must mean you have a pretty amazing instructor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, my my instructors are Adam Carl up at SJJ Kringa. Yep. Um, I've been training with him uh, since 2019. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, I've just progressed so much with mm. my jiu-jitsu. Like, I've been doing very like very well under his teaching, and mm. I I feel like my jiu-jitsu would be nowhere near where it is without uh, him coaching me. Mm. Um, yeah, I've had I've had heaps of other uh, 
coaches though for jiu jitsu mm. over the years. Yep. Um, uh, but my progression has always been like very, it's always been upwards. I've mm. never really plateaued with jiu jitsu, I feel like. I feel like I've all, I'm always getting better yep. from each session to session. And, um, you know, I always think about every session when I get, like, get home. I'm always thinking about like every role that I had. Um, Do you take notes or? Yeah, like when, um, when I was really young, so probably like 10, 11. Um, I, I was training at Gracie Baja Pimple, mm, yeah. um, and my one of my my coach that I had for a long time, so probably like five years, uh, he wanted me to you know write write up these notes. I ended up filling like a whole notebook out just of <laughs> just doing sessions like ten, and I was like ten or eleven. I just fill fill out uh, every technique that we do, how how any role that I I did when and what I did wrong. Mm. Um, I feel like it helps so much. Mm. Um, even if you get the chance to film your roles mm. as well, that's even better. Yeah. You know, I always say, uh, you know, when it comes to competing, um, if you, you know, you film those, uh, those competitions, you can progress so fast. Mm. Uh, as soon as I started competing uh, monthly, my progression just like skyrocketed. Yeah. It was insane. Um, but yeah, competing, if you want to get better at jujitsu, or I feel like it might be with any. Anything. Anything. You yeah. need the pressure. Yeah, you get into that competitive environment, and it just, uh, it just, ex- you just excel mm. so fast. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so yeah, so you you're thinking one day you want to have your own jujitsu gym. In terms of the the fighting aspirations, you know, like I guess, um, have you have you worked out exactly what weight class you want to fight at? Uh, you, you probably you might even still grow a little bit between yeah. the, over the next three years or four. Yeah, yeah. over. Uh, like October till now, I've put on so much weight and uh, muscle mass. Like, I think it was part of the reason was because uh, I stopped uh, training and okay. I was only weightlifting and just eating. You know? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, because um, as soon as I dropped it, uh, I just started to put on so much more like mass. Hmm. And uh, I think it, and then I realized like there is uh, like studies to say that doing excessive cardio can affect uh, muscle gain hmm. and stuff, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I don't know what I, I will go to, but I'm not I'm not looking to weight cut, like mm. do any massive weight cuts right now. Yep. You know, I want to get to you know my natural potential Fun, for yeah. where I can go to. Yep. And then um then then I'll decide what I, what I want to cut to. But for right now, it's probably it's probably going to be lightweight. Yeah. Mm. Fair enough. All yeah. right. The last one was that welterweight, but you know I'm not a welterweight. <laughs> yeah, we both we both weighed in at 77 and walked in at 77. Ah, okay, know. so he he also walked in at 77 as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that was good. Yep. And ha- how was uh, how did your opponent take it? Was he all right? Like it was pretty fast yeah, finish, unfortunately. You know what for him, was so. funny? Uh, you can see on the video on the hand raise, he found out how he got finished on the hand raise. Oh, like, really? Yeah, you can see his face. He just kind of laughed. Yeah, it he off. laughed, right? Like yeah, because yeah. uh, once uh. Um, I put him the, to sleep and we like, got up and everything. He's, he stood up and he's like, well, what happened? Like, what happened? Because, um, <laughs> yeah, I feel like you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't remember. Like, yeah, you've, been, you've been choked out yeah. before. Yeah, you don't really remember. Like, you're not really there. Oh, uh, it's one of those things where it's like, um, you know, you feel like, oh, you're there, you're there, you're there, and then suddenly you're not. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was quite funny. I think uh, Renato went over to him and he's like, you know, telling him, you know, good job and stuff like that. And he looks at Renato, he's like, what happened? What happened? Oh, okay. Yeah, because I, I, I thought, oh, that was a pretty weird reaction for him to have. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, you didn't know actually what happened. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why anyone didn't tell him until uh, you know the hand raise was happening. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the announcer calls it forty-three seconds of the first round, and he's just like, just looks so disappointed. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah. It's a rough start. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. we're both debuting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, mm. but a great start for you. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was almost perfect. The <laughs> whole thing was perfect. Um, you know, being uh, with Renato, you can tell that he's prepared thousands of fighters, like mm. done it a thousand times. Yeah. you know, it's uh, it's really quite special what he he can do mm. for a fighter on fi- like a fight day or even the the weeks in preparation. Mm. You know, we had four days to prepare, mm. and um, you know, from the moment I saw. You know, uh, Renato. After I accepted, it's just like so zoned in, and we're 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 talking about how we're gonna win, how we're gonna how we're gonna do this. Um, even uh, uh, when I got to the airport, when we were going down to Brisbane. I see Renato, and that's all we're talking about is how the fight's gonna go and like mm. what we're gonna do, and like he's uh, just mentally preparing me. Like mm. it's quite it's quite special what he has. Yeah. You know? 
Uh, I've never kind of seen anything like it. Yeah, it's fun when, uh, you know, uh, when Cass and um, uh, Percy and I, when we went together, it was, it's a lot of fun, you know, like we're just there talking. Were you guys on it. SFC as well? So, uh, yeah, Percy, Percy's opponent pulled out, um, but uh, Cass and I were. And then Gase came up as well because she was at, I think she, she uh, grappled at Fusion or one of those comps up there. Uh, mm. I can't remember if it was Fusion or not, but um, oh the f- uh, FFC one, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she 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 had a comp on the next next day, so she came out to our fight as well. But um, on weight cut day, it was just you know us just you know having a lot of, having a lot of fun, talking shit and chilling out. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. You won. Uh, you won your fight by a uh, unanimous decision. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how did that fight go? So like, it was so uh, like I did a I did a full you know sort of view on in terms of what happened, but. You know, for me, it was more like uh, I just wanted to make sure that I, I, I showcased a good, uh, well-rounded skill set. Mm. You know, I wasn't really concerned too much about outcome. Like, yeah. uh, you know, it was just like, uh, this, this will be fun, you know, like, get, get back in there. and You're in pretty good shape uh, out there. I remember seeing it all. You're yeah. In pretty good shape. Yeah. yeah. So, Did you have, like, a full camp for it? Nah. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, for me, I'm, like, just always training, right? Like, I'm, so I'm, for me, like, I'm fairly – I've been very disciplined my whole life. Mm. So I started. Um, so I started karate when I was five. Oh, yeah. Trained karate from five to twelve. Had a couple of years off. Then found Chinese kung fu. Did kung fu from like fourteen to like thirty-five or something like that. I don't know, like 20, 21 years of that. Um, and then, like, uh, started doing MMA. Probably like, I did. I did. I competed, like, mid to late. 2000s or something like that and I did like pancreation um, and a few of those comps but um, I didn't really take MMA seriously probably till like um, maybe around 20 mm, when was it I can't even remember now but like I, I, I probably around 24 I know 2014 I was down at a, a gym in training MMA at 2014 yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at a gym in Wollongong um, so mixing it up a lot more. Like I was still training, but I was just doing other, like just, you know, Kung Fu and then my own stuff. Um, Do you feel like you took anything from just doing karate and uh, Kung Fu? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can see it in my style, right? Like yeah. you can see how relaxed I am in striking and yeah. all that's, that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's really good. Because I still, I still train uh, like a bit of karate right now. Yeah. I, I love the movement. Yeah. It's insane. So I, I think um, what, what, what's important is that you need to have different um, bases. You know, mm. I, I call it bases, but like, you know, like whether it's how you hold your hands, what sort of guards you use. You know, um, and I think you know what throws most of the people that um, that spar with me here in, in, at, at training is that you know I, I can mix up so many different styles, mm. um, and and you know so like if I if I go three rounds with somebody I'm I'm going to try and give them three different looks, mm. um, and part of that is yeah just because I've done so many different things, mm. um, and then yeah so so from that you know when it when it came to the fight it was just like you know I, I already visualized a whole bunch of different things. Um, you know, the, the thing as I, as I, that I commented was that, you know, I didn't expect him to be as tall as he was because I had my inside crescent kick set up that I was, that I was thinking, oh, that's going to be the shot. Oh, yeah. um, but because he was a bit taller than what I expected, it just came up just a little bit short. So I was like, I did land it, but it was just like... Come with a crescent kick. Yeah, inside yeah. crescent kick, so oh, yeah. inside hook kick. Yeah. You know? yeah. um, so, and I set that up from... Because I already knew, so like I already studied him. I looked at him. Okay, he's a southpaw striker. I know he only spin. He he he'll throw a spinning hook kick from a um, from his orthodox stance. Mm. So I knew the only time I'd ever be in danger of the spin would be from orthodox anyway when he changed his stance into orthodox. Oh, yeah. Because um, mm. I'd watched a few of his fights, so I seen when he'd thrown thrown it. Then I sort of looked at it and I go, okay, um, he wouldn't know anything about me because you can't really find like when I fought all those years ago, the footage isn't really there. So, mm. um, so in my when I game planned it, it was like, okay, I'm going to come out um, southpaw. So it's southpaw on southpaw. And that's going to allow me to set up the, the low calf kick. So chop the legs first. Start, uh, start working my way up. So, you know, low kick, low kick. Uh, went to the stomach. And then that was the setup to then go with my left leg, you know, inside, inside crescent kick. And then after that, it's like, okay, it didn't land. That's fine. Um, second round, changed style a little bit. So right. I, went to, I went to orthodox in the second round. Mm. And um, so that was my, the, I guess, the second layer that I was going to play. So this, when I... Did when you I, run like the the whole plan through with uh, with, with Renato? Like, um, coach Coach Renato, he, he goes to me, Johnny. You, you study this guy, and he's sort of he trusts me. So, yeah. <laughs> so he, I said, yeah, yeah, I know what I'm going to do, and he's like, okay, good. Ah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. the only thing that we uh, that Coach and I were drilling was just um, a couple of the uh, so, and you'll see this in the fight, basically from um, the underhooks 
so using the, the, the like a single underhook and then uh, looping it around the head with the kimura grip. Mm. So catching the head, underhook, and then throwing the knees. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the things that I, I, I had, uh, I wanted to make sure is that I could throw knees to the head. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So that's very impressive to study your opponent and uh, come with your own game plan and then go in there and just like, you know, yeah. unanimous decision. Like, well, see, this is impressive. the thing, like this, mm. it's what, like, so with my YouTube channels, that's what I do. Mm. Like I, I basically just study fighters. Right? I, I've seen, I yeah. saw the recent one with uh, Volkanovski, Volkanovski and, uh, yeah. yeah, Islam. Yeah, yeah, yeah talking yeah. about the setups and things like that. So, yeah, so even with like, um, so Percy and Gase who are, who are fighting soon, you know, I've already studied their opponents. And so a lot of the times I'll do like, um, uh, I'll, I'll play the way that their opponent plays. I, yeah. like, I like doing stuff like that. Mm. And then, um, you know, I've clipped up things for, the, for, for Gase to, to, to look at for her fight uh, on the first so that she knows some of the openings that she's targeting. Mm. Um, and then just, you know, like if, if fighters ask me, then I go, okay, this is what I think, you know, and I give them my feedback and then they, they'll go away and they can either do it themselves or they might ask me questions and things like that. So yeah. What's like the process of like studying, uh, you know, because it, it would be hard to find mm. like, you know, in the amateur mm. Like seeing to find yeah. fighters and study them. Yeah, it just like depends on who, right? Yeah. So I was I was fortunate that you know um, Andrew had been in there you know four or five times before. Uh, I don't think I watched every single one of his fights, but I, I, I got a I watched like three or four of them. Um, so it gave me enough of an idea to work out okay what are the layers I'm going to use. Mm. So in the second round, yeah. So the second layer that I was going to do was when I switched to orthodox. Now it's orthodox versus southpaw. Um, a lot of the times um, when it's open stances, orthodox versus southpaw. The southpaw is typically already trained in his head to take outside foot position. Um, so I was expecting him to take outside foot position and then I was going to play the inside. So um, by playing the inside, what I mean is that like, so as an example, if you're in southpaw, you're going to use your right hand as your lead hand. My left hand is my lead hand. So the moment you go with your right, I'm going left hook on the inside. Mm. So that you can see it in the fight, like he'll throw his right hand and then I'll throw my, my left hook. Left hand is a bit of a check hook on the inside. So I had like the layers set up in terms of how I was going to approach it. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it was like basically the moment we get to the, the cage, it was basically fishing for the underhook and chasing the knees. Um, and, yeah, so then in the third round, when we came out in the third round, like I, I, I shot a lazy takedown. Yeah. And it was, just, it was just bad timing and lazy, right? It was just shit. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, so basically, yeah, he, he sprawled, um, got me into turtle. Uh, from turtle, he went to the back. I'm very comfortable, you know, defending the back. So double risk control. Flipped it over like baseball bat style, and then just uh, turned in, got up, um, and then um, yeah, we ended up. He ended up on top of me against the cage because I um, yeah, because when I when I came up, I was still trying to take his head off. <laughs> like I was just yeah. I wasn't composed enough. And then uh, he's walking back to the cage and taking me back down. And so I was like, okay, like I'll take a breather because um, it's an opportunity. Like there wasn't really much happening. Um, and then it was like when as, as soon as I, I, I saw the opening to get up, it was like okay, it's go time now. So got up, and then um, managed to sweep the leg out, had him against the cage, and then it was just tee off time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and that's that's how the fight went. And like you know, there's so many different ways that it could have gone. Um, and you took the, took this one at 38 years old, right? Yeah, 30, yeah. yes, yeah, 38 at the time. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's still crazy. still still mixing it up, but yeah, like it's, it's just one of those things. I like age becomes a factor if you're not fit and healthy and you're not you know ready to execute um and i think you know like your opponent was 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 in much probably similar position like you said he is old but oh, yeah, i just don't, said, yeah, yeah, yeah but i don't know whether he had the like oh, but there know. was a difference though like uh you know if you look at the shape you were in yeah for that fight it's dramatic like dramatically different from what uh the guy i was fighting yeah you know uh the guy i fought like he looked like you know, probably lost a lot of weight mm. um, from whatever training he was doing. I had he been grappling for five years. Yeah, okay. So at the start, we uh, like what I knew about him, or what uh, one of the guys here at FFT told me um, was like, you know, he's been training for like a couple months. <laughs> he's you know he's d does doing this thing with base. Yeah. Um, like, you know, like the Winter Warrior. Yeah. yeah he, the, the, it's a similar to that, but yeah. then, yeah, I don't know how that got out mm. or like where that came from. Yeah. But, you know. I started hearing him after the fight, you know, like, oh, he has, like, he's got five years of grappling and, mm. um, you know, stuff like that. But, yeah, it didn't look like it in the fight, so, mm. yeah. Yeah, um, and, and then styles, styles make fights, you know, and, and this is the thing, like, I think at the, at the higher levels, you can get away with game planning for a specific opponent mm. and hiding uh, any technical flaws that you may have just with a better game plan. Mm. Like, that's the reality. And that's why, you know, so... Um, I have a fairly specific approach to how I approach film study. 
Um, and so when I, when I do it, uh, I'm not... Uh, I would say that the, the film studies that I, that I produce, they're more for me than anyone, anyone else, but it's right. more like if people want to... They enjoy what I do and they want to follow along, by all means, follow along. But they're the not f- the fights that, the that I study. study yeah. yeah. So when I when I do these fight studies, I'm not thinking about it from the perspective of how do I make this engaging to a viewer? How do I uh, make it simple for somebody else? No, I'm not thinking about it like that. I'm thinking about it as okay, let's take some some pretty difficult concepts or technical concepts and look at okay, how are these layers now applying? Mm. Um, so that's that's typically how I uh, approach film study. That you know, it's something that I do for myself because yeah, well, it's beneficial to you. Yeah, you know, like. Uh, Gives you like better understanding of uh, just fights. Yeah, you know? and and, mm. and one of the things that I always do uh, after doing a film study is apply it inspiring. Mm. So like when I when I um, work with any of the guys, like I always tell them, um, you know, if we if we're going to do a specific movement, you need to be able to do this next Sunday when we go to sparring rounds. Yeah, right. Because if, if I can't get you to to apply this inspiring that following session, then I failed. Yeah. Right. Because that means I ha- whether it, the concept's too esoteric or it doesn't you know make any sense or it's too complicated doesn't work mm. right so I, I, i'm always very big on like you know um if i do any work with people that it's like okay if this is the concept let's make sure that you, you understand it and then you can go nail this with the next partner that you got because otherwise yeah like you're not really improving and the like i need people to also improve because then that allows me to go to next layers as well yeah it's like in jiu-jitsu right like mm. if you if you if you go to pass guard and then you get straight to side control you never really got to work on the second part of your pass yeah right you might be doing a toriando and then uh from toriando you might need to go into a knee cut right mm. but you win you, you win with the toriando pass you don't need the knee cut yeah right whereas when the person gives you more layers then it's like okay okay i go to toriando oh he's got, got a lasso now i got to change the way that I'm passing or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So I, I apply that same sort of style into breaking down MMA. Um, and yeah, like I just love mixed martial arts from that perspective. It's just, yeah. you know, when you, when you really start to get into it, like I, you know, um, sometimes when I do a film study, it's like uh, I see something. So what will happen is like I'll watch a fight um, and then it's like, oh, I see this thing. And for some reason, like what I see is like, repeated sequences mm. so when i see something that repeats itself more than once it sticks in my head and then i and then i start thinking about okay what are the reasons for this mm. uh and then so when i typically then do a film study it's like okay so as an example in the volkanovsky one like there was two s- very specific setups that he used to try and cover the distance with Makachev. yeah and that's why i was like okay that's going to be the bulk of the study it's because you know why is he doing this specific setup because he needs to get over the get past the hands mm. um and then it was also interesting to then look at okay when Volkanovski did this, what did Islam do? Because, you know, um, Volko, you know, even agreed that they probably underrated, you know, his, uh, Islam striking is underrated and Volk's um, uh, grappling was underrated, right? Yeah. So that is just interesting, like, you know, that the fighters also, you know, they realise that and then it's like, okay, um, so what, are we, what does that tell us I mean, in terms of, you know, people watching it? You know, you can just watch it as a casual and go, oh, that's a great fight. Or you yeah. can go, okay, how do I, you know, if I try these setups, what it's going to lead to and what yeah. are the counters? So then that way it's like, um, and it's also why I love commentary, right? So part of the reason why I love doing commentary is because I get to play both sides, Yeah. right? So your coach will take you into the corner at the end of the round and he goes, okay, Austin, you need to make these adjustments, you know, or Austin, this, this round we're going to change the game, we're going to change the level, we're going to go low, we're going to go this, whatever. And when I'm, when I'm doing commentary, like I, get to go, I get to look at, okay, what did the fighter in the blue corner do and what would I change if I was his coach? What did the fighter in the red corner do and what would I change if I was his coach? And then it's like, okay, now when we go into the second round, what, ha- what actually happens? So I'm like, you know, trying to be Mystic Mac, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I'm doing commentary. Yeah. So that's what I, that, that's, I, I really love that because I feel like, you know, from a technical development perspective, like it's giving me a different level of understanding that most people would get because mm. most of the time you're only thinking about it from a one-sided perspective. Yeah. You know, you're going, okay, uh, if I'm in Orson's corner, okay, what does Orson need to do in this next round to, to change things up? But then it's like your opponent might have a totally different game plan. So then it's like, okay, we, we tried to change things up, but they've come out with a different strategy as well, and now it just doesn't align anymore. Yeah. Right? Mm. What, did you, uh, what did you think of that result, uh, Islam and... Oh, what did I think? Yeah. Look, I think... Um, the, I, I don't disagree with the result. Yeah. Um, yeah and and part, of the, mm. part of the reason for that is that, you know, yes, Volk, Volk landed some great shots, but... Um, one of the things that Islam also does really, really well is that, you know, you notice with a lot of the wrestling style guys that when they get dropped, they never drop to their ass. Mm. They always drop forward. Yeah. And that's actually a really big thing because that means that they don't score the, they don't score the knockdown. 
Yeah. Right? Because if he drops to his ass, oh, that's two points. Mm. Right? Um, but the moment that they, they, they get dropped... Is and that they, right? Drop yeah. it, dropping You're going to drop to your ass. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think um, Adesanya in one of his breakdown videos even commented, like when I think Gastelum uh, nearly knocked him down. Oh, yeah. You know, Adesanya's ass hit the cage mm. and he used the cage to stand back up. Yeah. So, like, you know, even though he, it knocked him back, because his ass didn't hit the ground, that's not, that's not a 10-8 round. Who, right? who, uh, Adesanya versus with, Gastelum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... So, so these, are the th- these are like little things and it's like, you know, sometimes when you get rocked, you, you can't pick where you're gonna, which way you're going to fall. Yeah. But if your muscle memory trains you that, okay, you, you, got, you copped a good shot, but then you end up on your knees and you're driving forward, well, you know, that's fair game to you because even though it was a great shot and it technically did knock you down, it doesn't count as a knockdown. Yeah. Right? And so, so it was just like um, those little things that... Um, Stopped it from being scored, you know, some of those rounds being scored for, for Volkanovski. Um, and then, but yeah, like it was a, what, yeah, so in terms of the decision, I, I don't disagree with the decision. Um, I think, you know, uh, as most people said, you know, Islam um, won the fight, but Volkanovski won the night, yeah. you know? <laughs> like, I, yeah, I feel like uh, you could, a lot of people will watch that at first sight and be like, oh, you know, Volk took that, but that you watch it again and mm. then you realise Islam, Islam took it. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, that's why I was saying, uh, you know, I feel like Volkanovski, Volkanovski won, won it from like a fight perspective. Mm. Islam took it the points perspective. If, if it was one championship rules, Volk's won. Yeah. Because uh, one championship score well, different. How are the rules in one championship? Yeah, so they, they, they sometimes would do score the fight in its entirety. Mm. And so then because it's fight in its entirety, forget about what happened in those last four rounds. Ah, okay. Volkanovski's on top, beating down for that last minute. Volkanovski's won. Yeah. Right? So they, they take into account how the fight ends. Ends. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting way to score. Yeah. So, yeah. like I, I feel like that changes how the fight goes. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and this is the thing. Like, I think, you know, um, that's what makes one I, – I, I love one championship. Like, I, I'm a very big advocate for one because I just feel like what they do is so exciting. Um, they're trying to – obviously, they're doing, like, this multidisciplinary thing, right? You can – if you sign up to one championship, you can do kickboxing. You can do Thai kickboxing in four-ounce gloves. You can do grappling. Mm. You can do MMA. Well, it's bigger, like, than, uh, bigger than the UFC, isn't it? It's <laughs> – Well, from what I've heard. That's well, what they'll what say, yeah. right? So they're – but the thing is, like, you've got to remember that a lot of their um, viewership is in the Asian market, right? There's just yeah. – there's simply more people. Yeah, well, right? when I was down in, uh, like, Singapore, I, I forgot who was – I think it was um, – the uh, Demetrius Johnson yeah. uh, versus uh, Rod Tang was coming up. Yeah. And there were billboards everywhere, everywhere in Singapore. Yeah. They were everywhere. And I just never, like, you wouldn't see any, uh, you know, many UFC uh, billboards in, yeah. you know, Australia or but, in Sydney. But yeah. even that fight, right? Like, think about that. Yeah. One round is going to be kick- kickboxing. The next round is MMA. Yeah. Third round will be kickboxing. Fourth round, MMA. Like, yeah. who does this shit? Yeah. Right? I like how they can, uh, you know, set up fights like that. Yeah. yeah. It just makes it so much more interesting. Yeah. It's fun. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, and like you know, they're they're in the grappling scene now, and they're they're, they're getting you know they got Mikey Musumichi and uh, all these top level grapplers trying to join the organization and, and grapple for titles and things like that. But they make it exciting because yeah, did, did Gordon Ryan? I think he Gordon was signed, Ryan's, but yeah. I don't know whether that's continuing or not. So yeah, um, yeah I don't I don't know what what. What's yeah, I got excited. I thought he was gonna be stepping into MMA. Yeah. But, well, uh, no, it, was, it would have been for yeah. grappling. Yeah. Super yeah at the time, I thought they only did MMA. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So, but like you know. Um, so, you know, the, the cool thing about their rule sets, though, is that they, um, they, they try and make it very viewer-friendly. So even in the grappling matches, it's like if there's no action, they'll, they'll actually yellow card somebody mm. and take away some of their purse to try and incentivize them to do something. That would change you to a lot. That's right. Yeah. Well, if you're a prize fighter, right? Yeah. So, so they're, they're basically trying to take out the idea that, you know, okay, outcome is one thing, yeah, and we, we want people to win, but it's important how you win. Mm. Right, like that, you actually put some effort in, and like um, I don't know if you watched the the Harry Gresh fight, but you know, like Harry, Harry got disqualified mm. in his last fight. He got red carded. Um, who was he? Who was he uh, against? One of the Indian fighters, I think, um, or Iranian fighters. Might have been one of the Iranian guys. But um, yeah, like Harry just didn't want to. He, he didn't really want to engage in the striking, and the other his opponent didn't really want to engage in the grappling. Yeah. So I think they both got yellow carded. Um, but then Harry got a second yellow card and then the ref ended up DQing him. Um, yeah, and, that and is wild. It's wild, right? Yeah. But yeah, like they, they're, they're very different in terms of how they approach it from a, that it's a spectator sport that, mm. you know, like to fight in that organisation, yeah, you've got to understand, you know, you, 
Uh, so you, what was because uh, I I didn't watch the fight, but uh, yep. what, so was Harry Gretsch like? Was he shooting like? Was he shooting for? Was he looking for a takedown or how how was he? He he would try and like say eat a shot to pull guard, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And his opponent didn't want to play with him on the ground at all. And then any time it got into a grapple, then um, like I think there was one at one point he was really close to cinching up the Kimura, yeah. and his opponent just like you know bailed straight yeah. away. So it's like you know that's one of the that's one of those things. You know, like stylistically, it's just a bad matchup. But you know at the same time, it's like fuck. Sometimes you got to go right. Yeah. You just got to you got to go for it. Um, but that's where yeah. So that's where one's very interesting as an organization. Like they do weird shit like that. Yeah. It's like, I you know, I strongly disagree with that. Like. <laughs> Uh, pulling guard in MMA like, <laughs> It just shouldn't be a thing you know? Well you, yeah. you can always try and do a flying attack right Like just Yeah Oh yeah them. of course Yeah <laughs> But if you're like deliberately trying to pull guard Yeah like, You know what are you doing Yeah you know? um, It's actually something I was uh, You know when I first started uh, My first uh, sparring session I came to train with Renato It was rubbishing me Yeah <laughs> Rubbishing my What gym are you doing too. Yeah because yeah, I'm just like Like I'm off there I'm, I'm training off Pure gi jiu jitsu, yeah. so no no gi, yeah. and just muay thai, training, <laughs> no muay thai pad training. So, um, yeah, I was I jumped in there like and I was trying to you know pull guard, like you know I clinch up and then jump guard. Yeah, um, I, I would never sit down, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was kind of funny in the, those stages, like trying to figure out how to fuse uh, you know jiu jitsu to MMA mm. and uh, you know my striking to MMA. Yeah, um, but once that started to come together and I started to understand how you should be training MMA. Um, you know, I started to do a lot better. Yeah. You know, because uh, it's almost like my when I first started training MMA, it's almost, you know, there were some people I could land, like, submissions with because they just couldn't see it. Like, mm. they just weren't aware. Um, but it was almost like it was a bit, like, useless with some guys, mm. you know. Um, so I needed to learn a way where I could use my jiu-jitsu effectively in MMA. Yeah. Um, and that involved, you know, like, well, like, because when I first started MMA, like my, my takedowns were terrible. Mm. You know, you, it's not so, it's not an area that's strongly covered in jiu jitsu. No. Well, it's, it's 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 covered in some jiu jitsu gyms, but it's rare. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I needed to focus on my takedowns, and uh, once I started to get them up to par, then mm. I started to see some like really good results. Yeah, you know, because I feel like uh, once we're on the floor and we're in we're in that kind of uh, area then um, it's like it's almost like it's normal. It's back to the jiu-jitsu again. Yeah. Um, you just have to figure out, figure out a way to get there and get to a dominant position. Yeah. Um, even now, like when I'm training, if I'm ever off my, off my back, uh, you know, Ronaldo always tells me like you're too dominant on top to, you know, sit back and try play, yeah. play, you know, go for your you know, triangles <laughs> off your back. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it, um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, how you can uh, fuse jiu-jitsu and other grappling arts yeah. uh, to MMA. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, um, yeah, I think we covered quite a lot. And yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Or otherwise, uh, how do people find you? Uh, oh, yeah, at Awesome MMA on Instagram. There we go. Uh, that's my main account where I share everything. Um, yep. But, yeah, follow me up on there. All right, man. All right. Yeah. Thanks so a lot for having me on here. That's all right. My pleasure. So, yeah, follow at Awesome MMA and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back in the cage soon. Of course. Be very soon. (laughs) Thanks. All right. Thank you.